God bless. God bless you guys. And welcome back to another episode on the podcast here on the Street Fishing Ministries page. And so today we have my brother Gabriel Aguilar here with amen, me. Amen. And so he's going to share his testimony or we're going to talk about his testimony amen. and and his ministry, Salvation in the Streets and what he does and, you know, how, how all that works and you know, may may God be you know glorified through this, and may you guys be blessed by this video, and you know just leave on the comments whatever you guys want to share on the comments, um, and you know just hope you guys are blessed by this. Amen. 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 So, Amen. getting into it, man. All right. So, um, yeah, you want to? Well, first I just want to tell you, man, or, I love you, man. I, I appreciate you. I'm honored to be on this podcast and uh, just to be here with you, bro. I appreciate you. Hey man, hey. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy you said yes, and you know you're here. Um, you know, I definitely, you know, cause I haven't even really heard, in a way, your test. I've yeah. like bits and pieces of your testimony, but I haven't fully, you know, like what we're about to do today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So to me, it'd be like almost in a way like my first time hearing your testimony. Amen. So, <laughs> amen. amen. <laughs> Hopefully, the questions that I sent you are gonna. You yeah. know, help mold the the way we can direct it. I think so. I think so. So I guess let's you know let's jump straight into it. So the first question would be, what is your church or faith background? Like, did you grow up as a Christian, or you know, how was it you know growing up? So growing up, <clears throat> my family it still has some remnant. Growing up, we were uh, brought up Catholic. Mm -hmm. And so in my younger years, um, my mom would take us to mass on Sundays. And uh, the thing about it was, is, is I remember going to, to church, you know, with my mom and, and would walk in there and it would be like five minutes and I'd be out. You know, I never, I never sat through a whole uh, sermon, you know, didn't, didn't get very much out of it. And it, and it wasn't, you know, the, the fault of anybody, but just... You know, that was that type of kid. If, if I was gonna go sit somewhere and and you know, the the monotone voice voice of the priest mm -hmm. um, just put me to sleep. And so there, I I, I heard about God and I had heard about Jesus, but but as I got older, just drifted away from that. You know, I um, when I was about twelve years old, my parents divorced, and mm -hmm. that was kind of like a you know, a traumatic moment in my life. I remember, um, you know, the day that, that my parents split up, I, um, leading up to that, you know, you, you hear people arguing and, and you can kind of get that, that some things aren't, aren't working out. And I remember the specific day when they split, um, there was a lot of like chaos in my house. Um, and I remember as a kid, not understanding how to feel about it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a there's a couple different ways that you can go is is, you know, you can you can cry about it and be upset or, or you can go the other way. And um, I went the other way with it, you know, and, and that was kind of the the not the end, but kind of the conclusion of us going to church and, and mm -hmm. you know, seeking that route. And things got kind of chaotic after after that. So. So I guess would you say. um the divorce of your parents would that have been um a, a cause of you going wrong or was that just part of what led you to go you know i definitely well without saying that it's you know your, your parents fault people, yeah, yeah. people things things don't work out um i think it's uh, more of the choices that i made from that instead of instead of dealing with how i felt about it i i locked it down you know the bible talks about in uh, matthew 13 jesus talks about a people that had hardened hearts and so i think that as a kid or as an adult when you make certain decisions um it has the potential to harden your heart mm -hmm. and me not wanting to get down to the root of it and say hey this is upsetting me i don't know how i feel you know what's going on what are we going to do i just I, I just stuffed it down yeah. and you know that's that's a way to deal with it, but eventually that'll come out in the wash. And it did, you know, I started making um, bad choices, hanging out with the wrong people, and I was angry. 
from that one moment. And as a kid and even growing up, I never really reflected back on that. Um, it wasn't until 30 something years later when I look back and, mm-hmm. you know, you start understanding and, and getting into the scripture and, and letting God, you know, draw out that stuff, that old hurt, the, the stuff that you hadn't thought about in years and, and pinpointing the stuff that he wants to take care of. And that was kind of the, the focal point, um, you know, when I got saved. So, yeah, I think, I think too, like, you know, cause you say you were like around 12, 12 years old. Yeah, I, I think, especially being that young of an age or, or even younger, we as kids, um, you know, we don't know how to deal with that. Yeah. So I think it, it's it's easier, especially to bottle up. It's easier to bottle up, um, not necessarily not deal with it, but more of like we don't know how to deal with it. Right. And I think most kids, the way we deal with it is, you know, we – rebel yeah you know we start doing you know yeah <laughs> you know hanging out with the wrong people mm-hmm. but it's 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 almost it becomes and i want i almost want to say i think the enemy uses that absolutely because the fact that <clears throat> especially yeah. as a young age you don't know how to deal or release um you know the emotional um baggage or bondage however you want to call it yeah we don't know how to release so therefore here comes the enemy and it kind of puts in our path this way of release, but that way of release damages us even more. Right. right. You know, because it leads us in the path not for healing or, you know, uh, um, freedom from that, but almost even buries us deeper. Yeah. And it puts us into even more stuff. Yeah. So it's 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 crazy, um, you know, with that. And so you said that's kind of like where you started to go wrong. And so like... I mean, and you don't got to go into detail, like exactly what you know. If you you don't feel comfortable, but when you say you 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 went down the wrong path, basically you started doing wrong things. Like what type of things did you begin to so, get into? So after that, um, you know, like you were saying, <clears throat> we we have to have you know the the human body, the human being is made up specifically. So um, God has order. He he has a a father and a mother that bring up kids. Um, and it's done that way, not not just because it it it's the appropriate way to do it, but there's certain things that that a that a child, a, a boy and a and a girl need from their father and their mother. And so when that's broken apart, um, things start to happen. And so as I you know would would go back to school and and deal with things erratically, you know I was getting into fights, mm-hmm. um, had a short temper. I remember. Uh, closely after that, I got beat up um, by these kids, and and man, you know, I felt like I felt like you know my world had ended because I was like, man, I can't even I can't even beat these kids up. You know, what am I gonna do? And I remember that feeling of feeling like helpless and, and thinking about everything that had happened, and I was like, you know what? Like, I'm never gonna let this happen again. Yeah. And so it was that point where my heart just just turned, and and I was gonna do whatever it took to not let that happen and so going through that that situation in my life when i was about 15 i started using drugs um my first drug that i tried was methamphetamine and um 15 years old man it was it was i was young you know i know i know people younger that did that but uh 15 is young because i look at i look at the kids nowadays you know we got kids 15 years old and doing drugs, you know, staying up for for three days, going to parties, and and the reason why I could do that was because I had, you know, obviously, uh, my dad wasn't in the house anymore. My mom, we stayed with my mom. She was working, mm-hmm. um, trying to keep a roof over our head, and you know, my dad was was doing the same thing in, in a separate location. So we had the time and freedom to do whatever we wanted to. And, and that's exactly what happened. Like you said, the, the devil used it yeah. um, to his advantage. And so making those choices, one thing after another, and, and my life starting out wasn't, it wasn't a bad life. You know, mm-hmm. I had, I had a, a great family, um, but it slowly started to turn into something that I never intended through my choices. And so um, 15, going to school, going into high school, you know, I just masked it with drugs. And so yeah. at that point in time, um, I was partying, 
you know, getting, doing any drug I can get my hands on. Started selling drugs, mm -hmm. um, getting into the gangs and, and fighting and, you know, fighting turned into to pulling knives and then pulling knives turned into pulling guns and, mm -hmm. and one thing led to another. And here I am, um, four years later, graduating high school by the skin of my teeth. Um, the one thing... <laughs> I thought I had closed yeah. that door. <laughs> Me too. I closed it. <laughs> uh, the one thing that I that I look back on and reflect on is is I really don't clearly remember my my high school years. Yeah. Um, by the grace of God, I graduated. You know, I, I uh, barely barely graduated, but I did it, and that was something that like. You know, I think back on it, and I'm like, man, like, how did that happen? You know, and it was it was God's grace. It was, it was God's hand on me. Um, and so I continued to live like that when we, after I graduated, just partying, mm -hmm. fighting, and just had no direction, you know. Um, I remember specifically I, I had gotten to some issues uh, with some some people, you know, um, hurt this, this guy real bad. Mm -hmm. And uh, it kind of made me reflect on, like, what I was doing, you know, a little bit. Um, people were, you know, my friends were, were going, some of them were going to college. Some of them were going to other places and starting to do stuff with their lives. And I think that at that point in time, I was just headed nowhere. And so I remember having a conversation with my mom and she was like, you know, you need to, you need to do something with your life. Yeah. And so one of the things that that came to me was was the marine corps you know my my dad was in, in the marine corps my grandfather and so that was something that i grew up um you know idolizing mm -hmm. I, I loved it you know i loved the idea of it it was it was like a marines to me were like superheroes you know mm -hmm. so um that's what i i grabbed tight to so when i was 19 I, I went to the marine corps um did that that thing and instead of using the benefits of the Marine Corps, I, I went in the opposite direction. You know, I, I got out, went back to drugs, and used that as a, it just made me a better criminal. So the, <laughs> so the one thing that I did uh, get from it was I was able to get, it looked good on your application. Mm -hmm. and so the jobs that I applied to, um, I think at the time I was working at Staples, and, you know, my brother came and he's like, hey, you know, they're hiring at the refinery, you know, you should, you should get in. And so I got in and this was a job, you know, the refinery jobs are, are great jobs at that time. I think they were like the top five in the United States yeah. to have, because you have a uh, opportunity everywhere to make money. Um, they have shutdowns that you work seven days a week, 12 hour days. And I mean, you, you know, yeah. as a young man, that was amazing to me. Plus, I was gonna be up. Bro, what in the world? <laughs> you want me to go close? Bro, that is never happened before. <laughs> Bro, it's open. Is it? Yeah. Uh oh. Oh, it's broken. Is it? No wonder. It doesn't close all the way. What happened? You want to put you want to put something up against it, my bag or something? I'm putting, I'm putting this other door. Right? Okay. <laughs> yeah, like you push it and it opens back up. Dang. It doesn't latch on. <laughs> really, that ain't never had before. I was tripping for a second. <laughs> oh man! Welcome back. <laughs> yeah, welcome back. Welcome back. Oh, uh, but I mean, uh, going back to what you were speaking about, so. Um, Throughout basically your whole high school, you was drugs, fighting, yep. gangs, um, up until you graduate, and you said you went into the Marine Corps yep. at 19. Yeah. So how long um, did you do that? I spent, well, I was supposed to spend six years doing that. I spent roughly four mm -hmm. getting into trouble, um, not, do, not, like I said, not taking advantage of the uh, benefits mm -hmm. you know and it was just something that was was in my heart it was it was i could never commit to anything you know um i would have all these desires and ambitions but it was always going back to to drugs and alcohol you know and, and alcohol was never really 
um, an issue for me. It was it was the drugs, but the alcohol would would you know yeah, it's not gonna mix. No, it's not gonna mix. You know, you, you get drunk and then right away you're going looking for looking for some dope, and so that was a that was a a cycle that continuously gripped tight to me. It was there was a lot of things that I had inside of me that I couldn't consolidate that i couldn't understand you mm -hmm. know um love forgiveness all that stuff was just very shallow with me yeah. you know um and so those things kept on coming up in my life and it affected every aspect of my life it affected friendships relationships with family um it affected my you know goals in life everything you know so um Eventually, get you know by the grace of God, getting that job in the refinery, mm -hmm. I was able to work there, <clears throat> and I made a decision that um, you know I was going to keep this job. You know, like I said, I couldn't commit to anything, um, and so I got hired in the refinery and still using drugs. Had one foot in the professional world and one foot out in the street, yeah. and that's how I lived my life for the next. Man, probably 13 years. Um, Man. In that time, you know, I would uh, meet, you know, my wife. Um, I would have my first daughter. And these things, you know, happened. And, and there was just something like you hear about, you know, having your first child and it changes you. And there was just things that happened that it just wasn't. It wasn't changing me. So you were still using yeah. while you got married, had your yeah. first kid. So how long how long did you use? So um like I said, when I was fifteen, all, all the way up until I was thirty three, I was using using drugs. Oh man, that's almost eighteen years. Yeah, eighteen years. Oh, and I mean see it, it it varied at times, but it was consistent. Yeah, you yeah. Know? Um it just got worse and worse and worse. And so um in after having my daughter and after you know moving in with with crystal it just it just got worse you yeah. know i um would start missing work um things started happening there was a lot of a lot of crazy stuff that happened um but eventually in about 2014 i got a job in the refinery but for a, a different department and it was a department mm -hmm. that that i was looking to get into, you know, like I said, I had goals and ambitions, but it was just like they, they would come and go. It was just like I would yeah. always, I, right when they'd get in my hand, it would just something would always happen, and it was always a choice that I'd made, you know, mm -hmm. not showing up or or not doing something I was supposed to, or just not finishing what I had started. And so this specific job was uh, part of the fire department in the refinery, and so I actually got the job and I was juiced and. Throughout my time in life, there was there was certain things or opportunities wh where I would say like, okay, I'm gonna stop using drugs and I'm gonna stop being this way at times, and and every time would just go over. Or when I turn 21, I'm gonna stop using dope and stop living my life like this. And yeah. these this time would just come and pass, come and pass. And this was another opportunity where I thought to myself like, hey, this is a great job. I can, I can do this and and it's well respected you know it was just it was one of those things that that could change your life and 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 put you in a place where yeah. where you know you've always wanted to be and so i remember i got the job and they they were giving us training and so a couple months into it um we had to take this this uh, fire class and you go into this training room and um it turned off the lights and it was it was a movie and so up in that up at that time i think i'd been up for about seven days no sleep and um sitting there and all i remember is they turned off those lights and next thing i know i was like and i woke up when i woke up i looked over across the table and, and my boss at that time was looking at me and uh so we went to to disperse and he's like hey come here and I knew it was it was a wrap. Up until that moment, like I was able to to dodge drug tests, to, yeah. to lie, and and just you know, I thought I was fooling people. You know, really, I was just fooling myself. Yeah. And so, in that moment, um, I remember he he told me, um, you know, what's going on with you? And I was like, nothing. You know, just just tired from you know after work, making up mm -hmm. a story. 
and he's like, all right, you know, but this time we're going to have to drug test you. And the way they drug test at these places is they'll take you right to the on-site medical facility. And man, oh, like so right then and there, right then and there. And, and up until that point, I had, you know, you have the, the fake urine and you have the, the different items you can use to pass yeah. the test. But at this moment, I didn't have that. And so he's like, let's go. And, and we walked to that place. And I remember it was like, it was only about maybe about 30 feet away mm-hmm. from the building that we were at, but it felt like the longest walk ever. And I remember thinking to myself, like, this is it, yeah. you know, um, everything that I've got up until this point um, is about to be taken away from me. And so the, it was the clashing of two lives, you know, being able to provide for my family and a place for my kid was what separated me from the people that I was hanging out with in the street. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I was doing bad, but I wasn't that bad. Yeah. You know what I mean? I wasn't out robbing cars and, and, and doing all this crazy stuff. And so um, as I walked to this place, I walked in the building and, and they, they give you a, make you empty your pockets and all this crazy stuff. And they do a swab. And I remember the lady swabbed my, my mouth. And so how it works is, is when they swab your mouth, it, it gives a certain color and, and it lets the person taking the test, you know, know whether there's illegal drugs or yeah, whatever. Yeah. And I remember she swabbed my mouth, man, and it, that thing came out like as red as this flag. And she's like, she's like, wow, it, I've never seen it that, that red. <laughs> and so she just, it just made me feel that much worse. And I'm like, oh, wow. And so uh, my boss said, we'll, we'll give you a call, take the next three days off. And so I remember driving home and, uh, you know, calling Crystal and, and letting her know what happened. And I remember, I, I think I just hung up the phone. And on that, on that drive home, I had to make another choice. You know, all my life from, from the time that, you know, the, the hurt of my parents um, divorcing certain things in my life, you know, little things here and there, I would make choices mm-hmm. and choice and choice and choice. And, and then this was another choice for me. And I just, I gave up on that, on that, that ride home. I just said, you know, I'm just not going to do it. I'm not going to do it anymore. So it was the choice to just put two feet into the street, what I was doing. Um, you know, why fight it anymore? If I'm going to lose my job, it was the easier choice for me. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I did for the next Two years, um, I let my house go. Um, I walked away from my family. I walked away from my kid. Um, I just couldn't. I couldn't do it anymore at that time. You know, I, I had nothing left. I wasn't going to be able to come back from from this job. You know, in my mind, it was everything to me. It was the mm-hmm. thing that separated me from being the person that I knew I was at that time. And so um, everything just fell from there my relationships uh with my family with friends that that had known me for years um with my dad my mom you know um everything my houses my cars just everything just slowly vanished and and i was out in the street um pretty pretty much just gave into your addiction yes yeah and let that finally just that's it be the number one basically yeah if i was done i I, at that time i remember thinking like i couldn't even be a a father to my my baby Mm -hmm. you know i couldn't be a brother to my brother a son to my mom to my dad i couldn't be a good uh, partner to crystal you know at that time i i had you know we, we weren't married but I had proposed to her and even even in the proposal, like it was just my heart wasn't there, man. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I would try so hard to feel something, you know, and it was just dull. I just couldn't I couldn't get it. My love, my affection, everything that I had was just it was just it was like this mask that I wore. It was numb. It wasn't genuine. <clears throat> and you know, it, it sounds ridiculous. That a job like this would do it. And it wasn't the job. It was just everything that led up to it. Mm-hmm. And it, it was just like, I, I'm not going to be able to come back from this. And backing up about um, eight months after I had Ava, um, I got a, a call from my mom. And so um, she told me that 
one of my best friends, my, my best friend that I grew up with from like fifth grade, um, a couple months before that, I got into an argument with him. We were both using using drugs. And it was an argument just over something stupid. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, you know what? This is, I'm just not going to talk to you. You know, and, and I figured let let some time pass and we'd talk again. Mm -hmm. And so we left on bad terms. And my mom called me one day um, and told me that his sister had left a, a sticky note on her door for me to call her. And so I remember I called her and, and I knew in my heart, bro, that it wasn't going to be something good. And she told yeah. me that that he ended up taking his life in Oakland. He um, was dealing with a lot of things and I knew he was, but I never thought he would he would do that. And she she told me that he went into his his dad's uh, uh, shed and hung himself in there. And oh, that man. and that killed me, man, because um, because I didn't reconcile the relationship i didn't talk to him mm -hmm. um i let you know the addiction and and all these things that didn't matter get in the way of that and and that was that was kind of one of the last straws and so fast forwarding to the to the job losing the job it was just compacting on top of me but i mean i guess like i can ask that question where so you said you did that about two years lost all your hope yeah just fully gave into your addiction so where did the turning point come or the want to really change or or even did that come it and so over over the period of time like when i first started using drugs periodically it would pop up like i said like there were certain monumental moments in my life where i was like you know when i turn 25 i'm gonna stop living like this or when I do this or get this job or or have my baby, I'm gonna stop doing this. So I wanted to, but the thing was, was I couldn't. I would lie to myself and say like, I could stop doing this anytime. And there was even people that would say like, when I was out in the street, they'd be like, you know, you don't you don't belong out here. You know, you you belong with your family and and uh, you could you could stop anytime. You got a strong mind. You know, and, and, yeah. and I would sit there and, and the way I lived my life, the way I portrayed myself, you know, I had these people thinking that I was a certain way and really inside, I, I, I was never going to stop. I was, I was broken. I was hopeless. I had nothing left. And that's how I lived um, for, the, for the majority of my life. But for those last two years, it was just, I had given up. I was just waiting an opportunity to to basically die mm -hmm. and uh i would do some terrible things you know i i in in the place where we're where we're at in antioch um just did crazy things you know um got into several shootouts with with uh, different people mm -hmm. um i got hooked up with the local gang and and started doing you know stealing cars and um, building all kind of illegal stuff, you mm -hmm. know, and just living my life like that. And so I remember one of the specific people that I hooked up with um, was a dude that, that we were similar. You know, we both, you know, had the same perspective on things. And so we got along in that respect. And I remember <clears throat> we were stealing cars and, and we had a, a, uh, mutual associate that would we would all hang out and there was one night where we I was taking this person to, to drop him off to this to this other gentleman and um, I remember I got to the to the spot and I had my window rolled down and I was looking at my phone and I and I heard you know is that Gabe and they're like yeah and a second later I feel something hit the top of my head you know just rest on it and I look up and I had a pistol in my head and he said, get out of the car. And it was it was the, the same guy that we were doing uh, business with. Mm -hmm. And so I got out of the car and I was looking at him. And I remember in, a, in an instance, I just I just thought, like, smack the gun. And so I remember I hit the gun out of his hand and took off down the street. And as I got like halfway down there, I could just hear 
bullets whisking by my head. Oh, man. And so I ran straight in this area and, and hopped over this fence and crawled around the back of the house. And, you know, there's a couple different cars looking for me. So I stayed there for about a um, couple hours, maybe three hours, uh, about three o'clock, walked back to this house. And the house that I was staying at, um, we were paying the rent for this house where these people lived. And we would just sell dope out of the house. And so it wasn't unordinary for people to be there all hours of the night. Uh, and so, so I remember, it was like a trap house. It is. It was. It was. And so when I got back there, I was so angry, man, and so uh, mad that I got in there and I didn't have anything on me. Mm -hmm. you know? So I grabbed my pistol and I put it on the, the desk and, you know, I was plotting on what I was going to do. You know, when you have drugs in your system, you've been up for several days, you're not thinking straight. Yeah. And so about an hour, two hours later, there was a knock at the door. And it, like I said, it wasn't unordinary for people to come all hours of the night. And so me not thinking, got up and went to answer the door, leaving my pistol in the room. Open the door and... It's that same, same guy. I open the door. I, I get a gun in my chest, and I and I look at him, and, and I remember, I didn't even hear what he was saying. I was just thinking to myself, like, this is what you get. Yeah. This is oh, what you get. And so I remember when I finally kind of clicked into what was happening. He was telling me, "Where's the money? Where's the dope?" And and you know, out of my mouth, I said, "It's in the room." I said, "You know, right over here." And so I turned around. I'm walking into the to the room that I was staying at, and I was thinking to myself, like, this dude's going to shoot you. At the very least, shoot mm -hmm. you. And reflecting back, you know, he had, one time we got into an altercation, he had pulled his gun out. And I said, man, I said, if you ever pull a gun on me again, I'll kill you. I meant it, you know, to mm -hmm. not do it. And so all this stuff is is going over in my mind, and I'm like, at the very least, this dude is definitely going to shoot you, if not kill you. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, you know, it is what it is. And so as I get through the door, I get this this thought of just telling him, hey, you know, close the door. We don't need to involve anybody else in our business, right? Well, mm -hmm. I'm, well I'm going to get the money and get the drugs for you. Not thinking he would do it. But he turned around and shut the door. And I took split second. I grabbed a monitor off the, a desk that I had. And I swung it right around over the corner of the bed and just smacked him right back the head. And it stiffened him up to the point where the, the gun came back. And I remember he fell into my chest and I grabbed the pistol. It was about two inches from my face and he pulled the trigger. And I remember the round barely missed my head. I wrestled with him and, and stretched his arm out. I remember trying to get my, my foot where his elbow was so I could break his arm back. Mm -hmm. And um, I slipped. And so I fell on top of him. He, he shot two more rounds in the wall. I rolled his arm up and he shot another one in the house. And um, I was on top of him. So I was able to, to get him with my elbow and just start beating him. And so I beat him pretty bad to the point <clears throat> where he dropped the pistol. And I remember I threw him up in the corner of the, the bed and just kept smacking him in the face mm -hmm. um i'm sorry for the, <laughs> the words i don't have any other no, terms no, to kind of no describe worries. that and so when i knew he wasn't gonna fight back i i went back and I, I grabbed the pistol that he had dropped and and i cocked it back and i remember a round came out and um all i remember is i was furious and i, I put it in his face i hit him with the tip of the gun and and i pulled the trigger mm -hmm. and so when it, when it rains outside, you know, when it's on a rainy day, um, there's some times where, you know, the, it, it's overcast and, and um, the clouds are, you know, all gray. And so the, the, the environment looks a certain way, but, but there's times where the clouds separate and the sun shines through and you get that one spot of light that just opens up that, that certain area of wherever you're yeah. at and then it slowly closes again. And the best way I can explain what happened was when I pulled that trigger, um, I heard a loud voice and it was like the atmosphere in there, in there changed. And I, I heard show mercy. And I thought to myself, 
you've been up for quite a long time and you're, you're hearing voices. And um, so I, I disregarded it. And, and I remember mm-hmm. I put the gun back in his face and pulled the trigger again and nothing happened. Um, I heard the voice louder and it was almost like it, it just rumbled in the room. And I thought like, I didn't know what happened. I didn't know what it was, but I knew I wasn't going to do that again. Yeah. Um, and I remember there was a there was a stool in the room, and I sat there and just checked out. So who knows how much time passed by, but he gained consciousness. And I remember that's when I kind of like came to the realization of what was going on because he got up, and I remember he was yelling at me, saying something, but crawled around the outside of the room and, and left. And it was like it was like time came back into play, and I th- realized. Man, we just shot four rounds in this room. Um, who knows what was going on with the people out there? And I said, I gotta, I gotta get up out of here because either, either the cops are gonna come or or his people or his people. And, you know, he was he was a somebody. Yeah. And so, definitely there was gonna be a, a green light, and there was on me for mm-hmm. for putting hands on him, right? So I grabbed the pistol, grabbed uh, the stuff that I had, and I ran out the back door. And, Jumped over the fence, and here I was in the next door neighbor's yard uh, between two trash cans once again. And I had, to, I had to make a choice. And at that time, I knew that I couldn't stay in the city, you know. Mm-hmm. So a couple, maybe about six months prior to that, my family, my mom, my sister were talking to me about getting me into a detox, <clears throat> which went in one ear and out the other. Um, but at this moment, I was like, I can go to a detox. It's not a program. Um, seven day detox and, mm-hmm. and, you know, get a plan together. And it was, it was outside of the city. It was in Richmond. It was a neighborhood, neighborhood, uh, detox center mm-hmm. in Richmond. So I went, I went out there, um, got dropped off, checked in. And I remember talking to the lady, you got to go through the, the receiving and she talks about, you know, what's been going on and what kind of drugs you've been using and how long. And I remember I told her, and she, I remember she dropped the pen, I told her I was using meth from about 15 years old till about now. And she's like, she was like, boy, somebody's been praying for you. She's like, you still got all your teeth and, and just, you know. Yeah, that's crazy. And so I finished that and they take you to this room. Um, to detox and it's, there was like four bunk beds and a bathroom i mean and it was stunk i mean it was it, it to me it was like a like a mortuary <laughs> it was just <laughs> there was people just laying everywhere and just and just moaning and groaning and you know coming down off of heroin and, and all all kind yeah. of things so remember i sat in that place and they gave me a bunk and I sat there for the next couple of days. And I remember on the third day, you know, f- at that moment, I had been using drugs for those years. But the, the past three or four years, it was every day. Yeah. You know, I was using drugs every day. And so to have a, three days where you're not putting that, that substance in your body, you know, things start to happen. And so I started to detox and, you know, everything that, that I had done in my past. It was like, from the time I was 15, it was like everything sped up, you know, and I was I was just going through life, mm-hmm. you know, doing my thing. And in this moment, um, I started to remember, you know, the enemy always wants to remind you uh, of what you did wrong. What about this? What about that? Yeah, he's the accuser. He is the accuser. And so I began to think about everything that I did, even the little things that just, that just, Kill me, man. Um, the relationships I ruined, the things I said to you know my parents, mm-hmm. um, what I said to to Crystal, um, the relationships that I destroyed, you know everything, the opportunities that I had and I squandered, um, everything, every detail was coming out, and I remember <clears throat> it was so overwhelming to me that I started to tear up. And, you know, the one thing is, is, is you, you can't be soft, you know, you can't yeah. cry, especially in, in, a, in a room full of men. Like the last thing I was going to do was cry. And so I remember looking up and 
the feeling in me was just so overwhelming that I couldn't even like, I couldn't muscle it down. So I, I said, I'm gonna go to the bathroom in my mind. And so I got up, made my way to the bathroom. And as I, I broke the, the barrier where the door closes, I, I shut the door and I just, I began to weep, man. Right. <clears throat> and I remember even the thing that I said, like every everything that I said I wouldn't do, you know, the enemy would put me in a situation to where I had to do it. Yeah. You know, I wasn't gonna I wasn't I wasn't gonna smoke dope, smoking dope. I wasn't gonna slam dope, mm -hmm. slamming dope. I wasn't gonna do this for drugs. I was doing that. And so when I got to that restroom, the only thing that I could think about was ending it, taking my life. Like I I'd had it. And I'd said, like, I would never take my life because I'm not a coward. and You know, I don't want to do that. But it was the first thing I thought of. And so I remember I looked in, the, in this bathroom, and this bathroom was filthy. Um, there was a medicine cabinet. <clears throat> I walked over to that medicine cabinet. Maybe they had razors or, or something to use. I could pull the razor and slip my wrist. Mm -hmm. There was nothing in there. I remember looking to the, to the right of me, and there was a window out there, it was like a, a six cut window, it had a bracing in there. And I thought I could put my head through that and, and maybe break the glass and, and slip my throat or whatever I was gonna do, but the glass was like two inches thick. Mm -hmm. And I remember at the realization that I couldn't even, couldn't even kill myself if I wanted to, I just, I broke, man. Mm -hmm. I broke down and, and I remember putting my hands on the wall and just, and just fell to my knees <clears throat> and everything that had happened was just bearing down on me. And going back to my refinery days, I had a one brother, um, and I knew my mom was praying for me. I wanna say like, your parents, your mom, their, their prayers are powerful because she was, she was praying for me. Um, but the other uh, gentleman, well, there's a couple, couple different, different people that would talk to me about about Christ, but it was just, I, I would listen out of respect, mm -hmm. um, but it just went in one ear and out the other. Yeah. You know, one, of the, one of the brothers that preached to me was Ken Seeley for okay. 10 years, for 10 years, and he was persistent. You yeah. know, every time he see me, he would, he would talk to me about Jesus and, and how, how God could restore lives, and no matter what I'm going through, that I can, that I can surrender it all. And you know, in my mind, I respected Ken. But what he was saying to me was just, it was, it was gibberish. I, I was just like, <laughs> in my mind, I was like, you believe in a, an imaginary sky god in, in some book that, <laughs> that a man wrote, right? And, but, I, but I respected him, so I, he would, I would never, that would never come out of my mouth. But in that moment, I remember when I hit, hit my knees on the ground and, and, just, and just bawling, um, that's who God brought back to my remembrance. And I remember hearing about a God, and I remember hearing about um, yeah. Jesus. And it was in that moment, man, that um, I gripped tied to it. I said, you know, if, you, if you're real, if you're real, and you can help me, help me, and I'll follow you the rest of my life. Yeah. Excuse me. No, man, it's true. You make me <laughs> tear, bro. <laughs> See, it's crazy too, cause so I actually, I you know, I have a similar, um, you know, I guess experience in yeah. that sense, and it almost goes to show exactly what Scripture says, where you know those those seeds are planted. Yeah, because exactly how you just explained is how I was with my father. Yeah, like you know, so my dad was a pastor, an evangelist. So me growing up, I was pretty much like anti-God, anything, anti-Christianity. And every time, you know, growing up, you know, my parents, oh, God, this, God, that. And, you know, I would listen, you know, because they're my parents. Right, right. But it just, you know, went in, a, you know, in one ear, out the other. Yeah. It wasn't, you know, to what I thought, I wasn't paying attention. And it came to the point where after, after giving my life to God and, and so I gave my life to God in, in March 16, 2008, wow. and my dad passes away in August 2008, Man. a couple months after. 
And this is me after like trying to kill my family, trying to kill myself. And then my pops passes away. And I, I, I relapsed. Like I, you know, backtracked and started drinking again, started smoking again. Suicidal thoughts came back. And then it came to the point where Thanksgiving came. Pops wasn't there. First year without him. Christmas came. He wasn't there. And my birthday is two days after Christmas. Right. So every every birthday, even though we didn't have a, a necessarily good relationship, we still went out to eat together. You know, we had some sort of of you know, you know, time together. Yeah. And so Thanksgiving wasn't there. Christmas wasn't there. And then my birthday came, and it's just and I'm already feeling when I'm feeling and and it was like God, like I give you a chance and you take my dad away, man. And so, like, I always felt like I never got to redeem myself as a son. Right. And it was crazy because my birthday came that year and the suicidal thoughts came back. And it, it was it was so crazy, like, so intense. And then for a, for a slight moment where God, you know, where I allowed God to speak to me, everything that my, my dad used to tell me when I was a kid, just all of a sudden- Came back. Came back. <clears throat> and it was just like, dang. And it, it, it would kind of like, you know, jump started me back. Yeah. And I was like, you know what? Like, I need to shake this off. Like, no, like I can't give up. Like I said, I was going to give my life to God and I'm going to give it. And so it was just like all those seeds that were planted before when we, like, when we thought we weren't sprouted. listening. Yeah, yeah, they sprouted. sprouted. So it's like- that was the first time, or like later on, you know, after really, you know, getting, you know, um, involved in ministry yeah. and really like studying scripture is when I realized, you know, that part of scripture where it's like, man, like, that's why I think it's super important for us as believers to plant seeds because oh, yeah. you never know, yeah. like, you know, and even our jobs, like, especially, you know, street preaching or, mm -hmm. or evangelizing. Our job m might just be to plant seeds. seeds. Yeah. Like, we might not, you know, be the <laughs> ones to water them or, you know, to, to yeah. help them grow. But the, the the one thing that I've learned is it's so powerful to just simply plant. Yeah. Because, you know, later on, God will send those to, to water, water it. to like harvest. Yeah. yeah. So it's just... Man, so like when you, when you when you man. share that, bro, it, it reminds me of that because it's just it's so crazy how those seeds that were planted, things that we thought weren't affecting yeah. us when we're receiving, <clears throat> it's just boom. Yeah, and you know, and, and that that's what the Bible says. Isaiah fifty five eleven says that His word goes forth and it accomplishes mm -hmm. the thing that it sets out to do. So what Ken was doing, and he knew it, <laughs> you know, as he was he was planting seeds, and I just didn't know it. You know, yeah. and, and in that in that restroom when I, when I hit my knees, it was I had nothing left, man. Like I had nothing left, and and I remember just seeing him in my face and seeing a couple of the times about God and Jesus, and I said, you know, if you're real, please help me, and I'll follow you the rest of my life. And and you know, the walls didn't come off, the the the, the roof didn't come off, but but I had a a knowing in my heart mm -hmm. that you know things were gonna be all right, and I left that. <clears throat> that bathroom um and went straight to the phone and and you know started trying to call my family which obviously didn't answer um, <laughs> but over the next couple of days man i had some amazing experiences with, with oh, god and, and just reflecting back on uh what happened in my life you know i had a, a amazing just interaction with god experience with christ and the thing about it is is you know, I had heard God, I had heard about Jesus, but it's like it's like coffee. You know what I mean? You you know what coffee is. Yeah. You could see it being made, you could smell it, you could say that's coffee, but until you taste it, you really don't know yeah. what coffee is. And and you know, I had tasted God and and it was it was on from that moment. Over the next couple of days I called, you know, Crystal and, and my mom and told them, Hey, you know, I found Jesus, and they were like, "Yeah, right." <laughs> they were like, "Yeah, right." And, oh, and man. I was, I was dead serious. I was like, "I'm, I'm done with this." I, I, you know, I found God. I know who Jesus is, and Crystal was like, "Yeah, right." Mm -hmm. That's what you're gonna try and use. <laughs> and I remember she hung up on me a couple times, but 
you know, we, we, uh, we're here from that day, man. Yeah. You know, I left that detox. God. God slowly started to change my life. You know, and the, the Bible says that the goodness of God leads men to repentance. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, and that's so true. It was his goodness the, that at my end, when I had nothing left, like he was like, okay, this is the time. Yeah. And I had a choice. You know what I mean? I had a, a one last choice to, to accept or continue going down that path. And I, I chose Jesus. It was the best choice, best choice anyone could ever make. Yeah. Best choice I made in my life. Yeah, man. Nothing like it. There's nothing like it. Hey, Amen. <laughs> yeah, I think, I, you know, I tell people all the time, like, the one thing that I know I would never do is go back. Yeah. Especially, especially, you know, doing ministry, you know, especially specifically street ministry, you know, coming into contact with people, you know, and I'm sure you have similar experience where you go out and you're preaching to people or you, you connect with somebody that you meet while evangelizing and then you get to see that transformation. Because, I mean, even though we experience it, we don't see it from the, yeah. you know, outside the, the box, basically. But when you see it from outside the box and someone go through it, it's different. And and I tell people all the time that I can I can never go back because what God has allowed me to see through other people's transformations or yeah. other people coming to God, like, I can never go back because of that. Yeah. You know, seeing that transformation... Like not just seeing people accept Jesus, but actually seeing a transformation. Yes. Like going from this to this. Doesn't happen. Bro, it, it doesn't it, happen. You can't. It doesn't you happen. Can't. That's what that's what what's so crazy about people saying like, you know, that God isn't real, Jesus isn't real. If it wasn't real, you and I would not be here. Oh yeah. We'd be dead and somewhere terrible right now. <laughs> you know? Um and that's the thing is like if if I couldn't just go into this bathroom and and accept Jesus into my life and and it would just change. Mm -hmm. It wasn't gonna happen. I tried for 18 years. I tried to stop. I couldn't yeah. do it. My my family couldn't do it. The 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 understanding of like I couldn't be a father to my daughter couldn't do it. You know, it it, mm -hmm. it was it was over for me. Um, but God sent His Son into the world. So that you and I would have a way out, yeah. and it's a it's a beautiful story, and it's it's real. It's the, the realest thing I've ever experienced, man. You know? Yeah, and I think it goes to show too. Like, there's nothing that man could do, um, you know, to really make that happen. Like, you know, we're I mean, we're vessels, and we're here to 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 shine a light, and you know, for God to use us. But at the end of the day, it's everything that God does. Yeah. And you know, between the God, you know, God and that person, and and so you know, our part is just to simply either plant seeds, water the seeds, or be there for the harvest. Yeah. We're simply just there to be used. Yeah. But at the end of the day, is between them and God. Yeah. And so it's man, it's like I said, it, it's something that especially seeing it firsthand, I can never go back. Yeah. Like we can never go back because of that, and yeah. you know, and we see it. You know, so much. Like, it's just, you know, I I, I can't even fathom going back. Yeah. yeah it's, it's like, it's not even like. It would be, it would be terrible. It does, yeah, yeah, I can't compute that because yeah. it's just, especially <clears throat> like, you know, not just the tra seeing the transformations in other people, but what God has done in my life. Yeah. Like, you know, like I tell people all the time as well, like, I live my life, or at least I try to live my life, like I'm in debt. Yeah. Because I realized I'm past expiration. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. I'm past expiration because I should have probably passed away a long time ago. Right. Especially because, like, I had a hit put on me at 15. Dang. Like, I should have been, you know? Yeah. I should have been. Like, I've been in so many car accidents. <laughs> yeah. I should have been past. But it's it's through the grace of God, and, and I understand the calling that that God is is, is is calling me for and giving me that, you know, I, I try to live my life like I'm in debt because I am. Yeah, my life is indebted to God, Absolutely. and therefore I try to live so. So every time, you know, like if God calls me to do something, you know, like I always tell people, like I'm just being obedient. Yeah, I'm not trying to, 
You know, even with this, I'm not trying to be out here, go viral, famous. Like, I'm just being obedient. God told me to start a podcast. Like, start, start a, a podcast. podcast. Yeah. <laughs> like, no question about it. Yeah. It's just simply because he says so. Yeah. So it's just, you know, just me trying to be obedient. Yeah. Um, you know, we could probably sit here and talk for hours. Yeah, we could. Um, you know, especially as much as, you know, we've seen and experienced, like, man. <laughs> That's what I tell people all the time when it comes to like to talking about God and mm-hmm. and you know stuff like that. Like you know, I'm I'm endless. It's exciting because yeah, yeah especially like once you've experienced God and seen other people experience God. Like bro, it's just it's one of the things that I could talk about forever. Yeah. So. <laughs> So I mean, I'm with you on that, man. I mean, so I guess to just kind of fast forward, um, you know, we kind of covered most of of you know sort of the questions and you know your your where you come from, your kind of transformation in mm-hmm. a way. So I wanted to talk about um, you know before we finish it. Um, so you have a ministry, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So that ministry is. Salvation in the streets. Ministries. Salvation in the streets. So, what would you call, or what you would consider that a street ministry? Yeah, it's, it's an outreach ministry. That's how it started. It, it's kind of been multi-faceted mm-hmm. to to other things, but but it started out as an outreach ministry, and you know, just just trying to. One of the things was, uh, you know, in in church, we, we would. You know, hear the word, and and you know, for me, I w- I was new to all of it. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, I thought I had this perspective on Christianity um, negatively, and th- and then you know, here I am, two feet in it. So I'm just like, I want to know it all. You know, I want to I want to see it all. I want to do it all. And so, um, leaving the detox, you know, I I got a King James Bible and an iPad, and and you know, started to study. Mm-hmm. And I would read about, you know, the, what the disciples did and, you know, Philip the evangelist and, and other things. And so going to church, you know, they have different, um, those those gift tests. And so I remember I took the test and I, I scored really high on the evangelist. Yes. And I was like, I remember thinking, man, I don't want to be an evangelist. I don't even know what it is, <laughs> right? It's only mentioned one time in, in the Bible. But I, I kind of just let let that sit, and you know, I would hear different believers talk about the lost and when the lost come and, and this and that and the lost and the lost. And so in my mind, I would be in the church like, yeah, man, when the lost come, we're gonna we're gonna preach to them, we're gonna do this, and you yeah. know, we're gonna talk about Jesus, and and it was gonna be great. And I remember sitting in a sermon. Um, and just God speaking to me like, you know, when, he, when are you going to go do it? And, and I was like, do what? And he was like, go get the lost. And so in my mind, I'm thinking like, I'm waiting for somebody to direct me to like, okay, now we're going to go get the lost, yeah. you know? <laughs> and God was like, no, he's like, go, go do it. And so I remember talking with my wife and, you know, the kids and I'm like, okay, look, at, this is what we're going to do. We're going to. We're gonna buy some pizzas. We're gonna get a little speaker box, and we're gonna go out there in downtown Antioch, and we're gonna preach and, and feed yeah. some of the people out there. And they're like, "Let's go!" And so we went out there one day, and and you know we've been doing it ever since. You know, it's kind of it's kind of evolved into to what it is now. Um, mm-hmm. But the heart of it is is just to see people transformed. You know, we have. 120 people over our group text um you know since then it's it's you know we're under under king's chapel antioch yeah um but it's we've seen some amazing things i've I've seen some amazing transformations and like you said like there's nothing there's nothing like that you know what yeah. i mean and, and there's nothing that can do that we can't just we can't just grab some food and, and grab a speaker and grab the bible and go out there and make these th- make these things happen you know, it's the Spirit of God that, that does it through our obedience, right? Yeah, amen. Pastor Aaron says, uh, what does he say? On the other side of our obedience is someone's salvation. And, yeah. and I, I love that because it's the truth. Yeah. We have so many people right now that are probably going to be watching this thinking, 
-hmm. you know i could i i wish i could do something like that well they can you know i think as human beings we get hung up on on talent and performance and this and that but god's not looking for that like i'm not the best preacher i'm not the best prayer i'm not the best anything you know what i mean i i'm i'm a man that loves jesus and just wants to see people saved and reconciled and doing what god has called him to do and, and that's all it takes step out in that and, and god will take care of the rest you know, so. amen amen and it's it's it's, it's crazy too because so i actually started similar like that mm-hmm. um i didn't start with pizzas but i started out with, with sandwiches yeah so i think me <clears throat> me and um a couple of my cousins uh, my brothers and sisters at the time, you know, they were all going to the same church as me. And, um, you know, so I basically just hit, because I mean, I was, I think I was 19, 19, 20, wow. around there. Um, and I wasn't working at the time, so I really, yeah. or I think I was, I think I was like half school, half work. So I didn't have a lot of money, right? Yeah. So I just got a bunch of my cousins, my brothers, uh, and just kind of sent out a text message, hey, like, like, uh, Let's raise up some money. We'll make some sandwiches. So I think we we spent like 120 bucks, and we went to Winco. Made a gang of sandwiches. Yeah, huh? <laughs> I think we made man. I think we made like 60, 70 sandwiches. Yeah, um, you know, ham and cheese, turkey. It's simple, you know, ham and cheese, turkey cheese, like simple sandwiches. Yeah, put them all in a couple baskets. Uh, went out to downtown by the Amtrak or where the Amtrak what used to yeah. be. And then just starting hanging out and handing them out, praying for people, talking to people. And that's literally where we started Amen. with some sandwiches. Yeah. And, you know, it's a, to where, you know, here we are now. Now, you know, I've done street preaching. Um, you know, now we're doing the podcast, yeah. the YouTube thing. So it, it's, I think, I think, yeah, if, if anybody watching this, like, you don't need a lot. Mm. Like, you can start off with some pizza, some sam- like simple. Yeah, it, I think the 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 most important thing is what we've already mentioned. It's just simply be obedient. Yeah, and then God would do the rest. Yeah. So I think I think if 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 God if you know for anybody listening, if God if you feel like God has called you to do something ministry or or feed the homeless or street preach, you don't need a lot to be in. Not at all. Because I think. The start of something is not your end. Yeah. So the way you start it, you know, I think shouldn't even really matter. I think the most important to start something is just do simply, it. yeah, do yeah, it. Just step out and do it. Like Nike says, yeah, just, just do, do it. it. <laughs> and, you know, I think it, and I think it is just we're in a place right now that we need, um, we need brothers and sisters to step out and mm-hmm. do it. You know, and, it, and it's 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 a heart heart condition um where's your heart at you know the bible calls us to live a a selfless life Mm -hmm. so what does that look like you know the bible says that christ died for the ungodly it says that he commends his love for us in that while we were yet sinners that that christ died for us um jesus gave the best example of of a selfless life and if, if we can click into that if we can reflect on what God has done for us, um, that's great motivation to step out in, in ministry, step out and, you know, it, maybe it doesn't have to be street ministry or, or anything. Just go go out and offer prayer to people, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Just to, just to do something opposite of what the world is doing in Jesus' name is, is powerful. So. Uh, amen. Amen. So, I mean... Man, excuse y'all. <laughs> that was a loud yeah. honk. Yeah, it was. <laughs> I mean, I guess the way we could end it. Um, so this, I guess the yeah, the best way to end it would be well, if you could tell somebody, whoever's watching, mm-hmm. one thing, you know, whether it's, you know, going out, starting something, or if you feel like God's called you to do, or... Or even a, a message. Let's say somebody's struggling right now. Whatever you feel God's yeah. putting you to say, what would you say? What I would say to th- this camera right here, uh, no, or this one, this one, this one, this one. So what I would say is is that God loves you. Jesus loves you so much. And though trials and tribulations in life would hinder us to the point of of drawing us to a place of hopelessness, there is a God in heaven that loves you so much. 
Um, if you're struggling with, with addiction, if you're struggling with um, identity, if you're struggling with, with these things that, you know, God is here to take those things from you, to uh, not only reconcile you, but restore those things in your life and bring you to a place. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. And I know that's something that you'll often hear in Christianity, but it's so true. And it's, it's never a, a, a term that gets old. God has a plan. He has a purpose for your life. And that plan is, is for today. Um, so I pray that, that if you're watching this, this podcast, the Bible says that today is the day of your salvation. That God wants to do mighty and great things through you and your family. Reconcile relationships and, and things that you never thought were possible um, today, right now. And so the, the message is this. It's not, a, it's not a complicated one, but Jesus loves you. He loves your family, and he has a plan and a purpose for you. Amen. Amen. Well said. So with that being said, you know, thank you guys for watching. Hope this, this episode was a blessing to you guys' life. Um, don't forget to comment. Let us know your guys' thoughts, anything you guys would like to share. Um, you know, something that, you know, God has done in your life as well. Um, let us know. Put it in the comments. Yeah. Like the video. Um, share it. Yeah. You know, let this video be a blessing, not just to your life, but to somebody else. And, you know, to to all the glory, all the honor be to God. And hope to see you guys on the next episode. God bless. Love you guys. God bless. Oh. Oh.